Okay, my apologies. Uh, had a little bit of a technical issue that arose here, so I had to deal with it. But we're ready to go. Thank you, those of you who are here. And uh, see, Patty, glad to see Blake, Destiny, and we're going to get rolling here in a minute. Um, so I just I had to deal with a couple of things. It's never static situation right here. So let me pop over here to 3503 and we'll get rolling. And again, I apologize about that. I'm typically 10 minutes early, not two minutes or three minutes late with the course. Okay. And we're back down here to the Loudon chapters five and six. And I want to jump over to Bible source and grab uh, and grab the Loudon text. Because there's some things I want to uh, cover in it. So bear with me here for a minute. And I appreciate you being uh, kind about that. All right. And I think I've got this login. And I do. All righty. Let me go back up here. And we'll grab the Latin text. There it is. And we're working in chapter five and six. And this again is the this week. Uh, we're looking at the infrastructure, the infrastructure around information technology. And uh, I think when I went on at great length in the prior session about what was you know those components and how those systems have evolved and continue to evolve chapter chapter six walks us into the this the concepts around business intelligence and they the authors do a good job here and we talked about this before uh helping us understand this, this quite the issue, and one of the big issues in business intelligence is how we organize data and how we, and how the, the file systems or the, or the architecture with which we, in terms of designing how we store and extract and, and share or i.e. distribute information. And business intelligence is, is really a question of trying to take, as the authors talk about here, the traditional file environment and move it on to something different. So <clears throat> the, uh, and they walk us through a, a series of problems in terms of managing data resource questions, major capabilities of, of databases, what tools and technologies to improve these and information policy data administration data. For my money, this is where you start, okay? Most companies are, are, are very adept. Uh, they have great technological acumen. They can gather and collect data. They can analyze it. They can put it into, into applications that will visualize it, et cetera. But they've never really sat down and started at the, at the beginning and said, why am I collecting this? What do I intend to do with it? What good will it do for me to have it? And who owns what data or how does data get shared? And that's this question of information policy. And so if you have the idea, the concept of a, of a dashboard, okay, which is the fundamental tool for business intelligence, there's no point in having a dashboard if, uh, there's no point in having a dashboard if, for all intents and purposes, uh, you're just simply collecting data that nobody's going to use, or you're collecting data that's that's of really no use to you, or you're collecting data that you can't have an impact with, which i.e. you can't use. And so this whole question of information policy and establishing one becomes a fundamental 
question. And I don't know how many times um, uh, over the years when I worked with people uh, that I, I found that uh, the, um, I, I would run into problems. And here's one just a minute, a minute ago, you might have seen it on my screen that said my internet, my internet connection was not stable, okay? So I'm sitting here, and I'm gonna check my connection for just for a minute. I'm supposed to be connected on employees, secure, okay? So far, so good. <clears throat> but this, the, the authors here talk about information policy, how the information is shared, disseminated, how it's acquired, how you standardize it, how you classify it, inventorying is involved databases, and specific procedures and policies that govern all of that. Now, when folks go out, and I, and, and I, don't, I don't do any paid consulting anymore, I do some pro forma consulting, but back in the old days, uh, people would be shocked when they'd say, okay, I've, I've heard great things about Oracle. I want to use Oracle in my retail operation. And, you, and I'd tell them, well, Oracle has a fantastic tool and they have, a, a, and they have several um, guides that are several hundred pages at least that tell you how everything will be set up. Companies like Oracle, like SAP, SAS, they demand that you conform to their rules. They'll do some tailoring, but they have enough experience, for example, in retail or in e-commerce or whatever, uh, to know the dimensions, i.e. the variables that you need to have, and they have a good sense of an industry, and so they know how policy ought to be put together. But companies are naturally resistant to that because they don't want outsiders telling them how to organize all this. So a, a key piece of this is, is just simply deciding what information do we want. Now, the concept of business intelligence, like concepts, concepts out of management science, uh, like concepts in strategic management are borrowed from typically military or, or information or intelligence information gathering entities. Business intelligence really models itself after military intelligence in terms of monitoring uh, what potential adversaries and friends are doing, et cetera. And those folks have trouble defining who owns what data and what data is really important. <clears throat> and the classic example of this is that the uh, that the gentleman who who flew the, the the airplanes into the World Trade Center. In fact, all of the people who commandeered a plane on 9/11 were out in Arizona training on a simulator on how to fly a jet. And the instructor and the owner of that place noticed that all they were all they were learning about was how to take off and how to navigate. They weren't paying any attention or spending any time on how to land. And so they contact, I think it was the FBI, and the FBI came out, took down some information, and never shared it with anybody. Because the FBI, like the CIA at the time, those other intelligence agencies siloed their data. So they were, that, they, that anomaly, which should have really triggered a, a, a quick investigation, just went unnoticed. So the question of policy is the most important one. And who owns the data? And what do we intend to do with it? And uh, companies, almost every organization, are, I would say the word would be intellectually lazy in not really thinking about how um, they're going to, they're going to, why, what data I need, why do I need it, how does it give me actionable information related to my 
annual objectives, my midterm, my medium term uh, objectives, my company goals, um, and my company mission and strategy, i.e. the KPI, key performance indicators, and at what, at, at what, at what, uh, at what level do we apply these? So business intelligence is, is starting to come into its own and is as typical the technology that's available far outraces <clears throat> the ability of people to handle that data. I would say if, if you're, I would say that the two best companies in the world in terms of business intelligence, I would say probably if you were to ask me who are the top five, <clears throat> I, would, uh, I would say uh, Amazon without a doubt. <clears throat> I'd say also Walmart without a doubt. Um, I would say probably a Capital One without a doubt, the bank Capital One. And I, I would say probably UPS and FedEx. And those companies and, and Google, they run the gamut. And that's because they understand that they, that because of the human interfaces that are there, people clicking on a link, link people purchasing a package, a driver taking a certain amount of place, there's enough real data to have process and to handle that they can get right insights. Capital One, uh, and I, 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 I don't remember offhand, but almost every semester I try to you try to have students read the book Competing on Analytics. And as you come to the end of that textbook, what you, that book, what you find is that they talk a lot about Capital One and they talk about Harris Incorporated who pioneered the approach. Capital One runs experiments. They do about 10,000 experiments a year. They will, they will uh, take a, a block, a segment of customers and they'll say, okay, if we lower their interest rate, and increase their credit limit, how do they perform? Okay, and they'll watch that and track it and see. Why would they do that? Well, if they can get you or me to up our credit limit another thousand or 2000 or whatever, and that means we're using their card, then we're not using somebody else's card. <laughs> And if they can track our performance, me and 10,000 other people or, or whatever, then they get a sense of the risk reward equation that works for their firm. Okay. Uh, so the, they have a probably a less than freewheeling approach, but they, their objective is to say, what package, what types of loan packages do we offer? Now, <clears throat> if you've been following what's going on, uh, Walmart's bank, okay, the, the, bank, the, bank, the bank that was attached to Walmart has now been acquired by Capital One. So Capital One and Walmart <clears throat> are now, for all intents and purposes, business partners because Walmart has access now to all of that technology burgeoning or fundamental that it was that they had there at, 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 what, at Walmart's bank. So if you have a Walmart car or, or, you know, and you use it, you'll continue to be using it, but at a certain point it's gonna switch over to a Capital One. So this whole question about um, information policy is important and then, you know, the, the issues of data, the authors talk about the issues of data, data administration and data governance. Um, and it's a far, data admin is not data management. Data management is how I put together a database and, you, and, and, and piece it all together, et cetera. Data administration says, why do I have this database? Why did I design it like it is? 
why do I have these points and, and how I collect information and, and, and what, what type of, uh, what, what type of format do I want to use in terms of, of the data warehouse extraction, uh, taking data and extracting it and, and reformulating, and what do I do about unsupervised data that's out there, and how do I handle that and, 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 and put it into the mix? Then the issues of data governance. Who ought to be looking at what? So, the as I said before, one of the challenges in this course is bringing you to understand that it's this course is more, this course is abstract or conceptual, not about a particular set of software and not even really about enterprise computing, okay? There are courses out there that will give you, will teach you about enterprise computing uh, or enterprise resource planning um, that are very good courses. There's software out there. That's that's a technical level beyond what we're interested in. We're interested in is how do I take data and transform it into actionable data, i.e. information? How do I take that information and convert it into knowledge? In other words, information that is replicable, that's reliable and valid. And then finally, can I acquire some business wisdom, some insights from the knowledge that I've acquired operating? And, and that is, for all intents and purposes, it, it in a nutshell. The, the questions of, you know, the question of data quality, okay, um, and things like data cleansing, data audits, et cetera. Um, I, in the times, in, in the time that I have, in the time that I've worked with, in the time that I've worked with, with churches, I have been totally amazed at how they, the lack of uniformity in the how they count the people who show up, um, how they break that out. And if things are not done well, you can have a jumbled mess before you know it. I think one of the classic stories I can tell you is, this is my sister was involved with this and I'm not gonna name the company, but she was with a company that was so large that they'd go set up a business account and they would forget to build the account. Can you imagine being that big, that large? And so her job was to go out with a team of people and negotiate a settlement so they could get that customer online, get them paying uh, long distance bills. <laughs> and um, it was amazing. People wouldn't pay their bills for five years and they'd go, well, I, you know, I, I thought I was getting, I don't know, I understand about how that happened. Well, they just weren't getting billed. All kinds of, of issues like that, that, and the authors allude to them. And I, I can tell you one story after the another, um, particularly uh, when I worked with the, with the Duran Institute up in Chicago, and it was just it never ceased to amaze me how how people could be so lackadaisical about information they'd paid to get, um, so uh, I guess disorganized in how they put things together and it was really no wonder then they had quality control problems. And when I did some consulting and mortgage and, and uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, it was really amazing to me to, uh, to see how accounts got handled and, 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 and trying to, 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 and to look and have a, uh, a controller tell me, well, our, our cash flow uh, re reconciliations are always really far off. Well, why? Well, then I'd get some explanation and I'd be thinking, how have you avoided an accounting exception? So see those types of situations there and they're, and they're, and they're the, uh, the authors walk us through this, this, uh, uh, the Green Mountain folks, and they had hired a, you know, a, a firm to help them with this problem. And especially in terms of establishing a policy and then establishing 
data quality. And I guess the, you would, when I first, when I first got, when I first started consulting, I thought things will be pretty cut and dry out in industry. And what I found was often industry was far more difficult to deal with than governmental entities. Governmental entities, I guess, having oversights um, tended to be far better organized in, in how they handled information. Um, not always perfect, but they tend to be much, they tended to be better. And I'd ask myself, how could a business owner not understand this and not be willing to, to, to impose the discipline that's required uh, in terms of coming up with these types of policies. Now, the, uh, here in chapter six, okay, and, and talking about these foundations, right? What you've noticed is that it's been all about policies and procedures. It's been about mental constructs or a mental framework for handling information, for what we do with it. And from other than people, information is the most precious resource that any company ever has. And because that's the case, to embark upon a business intelligence effort without really being sure of what you're trying to accomplish is, is just, uh, it's, just a, it's a recipe usually for just a lot of wasted money. And sometimes if you're too small and too fragile, uh, it can be a real crunch on a company and it can sometimes lead, lead to their demise. Um, so as you look at that chapter, you'll want, to, you'll want to be mindful of that. And you also want to put it into, into the context of chapters five and seven. Chapter five talks about infrastructure and technologies, okay, stuff. And then chapter seven, which is face fascinating, talks about telecommunications, the internet, and wireless, which is another one of those pieces or components of information systems and one of the challenges that we have with business intelligence is not only getting people to agree to some policies and procedures, et cetera, but also because you have this, because it's difficult to get companies to become device agnostic. And what I mean is to say, I'm going to get the same data that I get from someone using a laptop as I do from somebody using a phone, as I do from somebody using a, 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 a tower. I'll, and if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm getting all kinds of different information from each of these devices, if my policies are not device ag agnostic, then I, then, I, then I create silos that are not only de usually departmental in nature, but then I have these I have these equipment silos, these um, device silos. And again, just layering more confusion on top of things. So six is a, is a good setup to chapter seven and, 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 and a beautiful segue to it because it says, you know, why did you give her, why do you, let me give you an example. I'm, I'm just going to have you a case study. This is a small university in the South Central part of the United States that at one point insisted that all of its employees have an Apple, have an iPad. Whether those people use the iPad or not, whether they were Apple people or not, whether Apple met their needs or not, you had an iPad. <laughs> and a lot of money was spent. And the iPads sit for those folks who don't use them. And there are some people who don't use them for a simple reason. They don't meet the needs of the people. They're intended for different. A Mac and iPad, Apple products are designed to do different things. And yes, I understand 
Microsoft Office on Apple is fine, but Apple doesn't have anything that equates to access. Uh, it's productivity suite. If you use Office for Mac, it's, 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 it can get problematic. And so there you have that issue of devices and, and what people are gonna use or not use for their device. So it, it, chapter six is, is a great segue to that question, to that issue. Now, the I have some other things here for you that I, that that I really do want you to go take a look at. And look, folks, your 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 mature people, you're paying a lot of money to go to school. And the worst thing I can ever do is is just try to spoon feed you every inch of the way. I'm not gonna do it because I'm not helping you. If I force you or encourage you to become lifelong learners, to become interested in, in, in and to force yourself to go beyond what's in the textbook and try to learn something more, that's a habit that's gonna be important for you that will serve you well as you go out throughout in your career. So that's why I have, for example, the web safari that's here. I have some TED speakers uh, lined up. I have some resources like uh, you know, a day with smart home products, um, using Twitter and Facebook for emergency travel data, um, a, a detailed map of the, of the US internet infrastructure, the most popular sites on the deep web. This is a whole piece of the web, of the web, worldwide web that mo a lot of people don't even know anything about. There's this whole shadow web uh, that deals in all kinds of things that people are just simply not, not aware of. And the NSA prison program, I think it'd be worth your while to take a look at that. And then here's, here's a resource about the Pentagon Papers. And then here's, some, here's a resource as it's still involving this question of Facebook and Russian accounts and how this, the Russians interfered in our elections. I'm not a political person, okay? Now, I'm not making a political statement, but I'm, I'm gonna make a statement purely as somebody who understands how information systems work and understands what you can do with them. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the goal of the Russian government through some of its operatives where it could have what we call plausible deniability interfered in our election, provided one candidate in for inside information, did things like hacking email to embarrass another side, had agents and operatives who were, who, who were there in, a, in, a, in classic intelligence gathering. And I think even more concerning is that they, is that we know they sniffed around our, each of our, they sent around our election processes and tried to see if they could get into state registra uh, voter registration sites. You see, if somebody can get into a voter registration list, they can change an election, okay? Uh, so if you have, if you go vote, the next time you go vote, think about this. You walk up there, you show them your identification, and, they, and you sign something that says, yes, I'm voting. You walk over and you, and you, and you, you do your ballot. In Oklahoma, they have these things, you, you do your ballot, and then you put it, and it scans it, and it's gone. So far, so good, except for one important thing. The people who are sitting at that desk are given the names of the eligible voters. And the names of the eligible voters come from what? A computer printout downloaded at each county's office and then distributed to the various precincts. So if someone can compromise voter rolls, they can change an election, a general election for sure. Maybe not a primary election, although in Oklahoma, for example, independent voters can vote in, in the Democratic primary. They can't vote for the Republicans. So, in the, so if you changed registrations of independent voters, 
uh, you you could alter uh, you could alter things. Now you said, well, there's a fail set because they check to see what your party affiliation is. Yes, they do. But if if <laughs> If, if the system's been compromised and they rely upon said driver's license as opposed to a registration card, voter registration card, someone says, well, let me see your license. Then away you go. So we know that they've been out there trying to, to get into, or in more, more concerning, the most concerning thing is if they can, if they can, get into the count processing, the processing of voter election results, election counts. If they can get in there, they can do anything. And I'll tell you one thing, it's this. If you don't think the Russians are really adept at what they do, you could ask the Ukrainians who had their, who had their, uh, their, their government's operations shut down just for I think it was for maybe a few hours, maybe even a day, by they determined the Russian hackers, they just shut down that government. And we've had them sniffing around uh, infrastructure, financial systems. So this is you know, certainly, this is, these are some, this is a resource for his right here that is certainly worth you looking at and following. We're experiencing the same thing in terms of the theft of intellectual property by Chinese companies. China continues to say, we don't want to trade war. We want to do business as usual. There's a reason. Why should they invest trillions of dollars in universities and training programs and graduate degree programs and infrastructure to support a scientist or an engineer who can come up with a breakthrough or a biochemist when they can just steal it, the patent, steal the method, the method used and have it for practically nothing compared to what it would cost to develop it. Well, that's why this, the, the one large uh, Chinese company, communications company, uh, was summarily booted out or, or is put under severe constraints by the United States because we had discovered that they were indeed stealing our, their engaged in industrial espionage. So this, this chapter is, is, has some very far reaching issues and 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 in it and that's why i give you these resources to go out and, and to take a look and, and to go a step beyond and the i use these resources also as a means to get you started so that you'll say okay wow that's interesting well what's the latest going on with 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 facebook and russian accounts and, and now it's you know these hate groups or or people out here these so-called lone wolf people who will post something and hours later they shoot up a church or they shoot up a school or they go uh, into a, some kind of public function or a restaurant. Um, this is yet another one of those situations where they determine, and if you've been watching the news in Oklahoma City in the past month, we've had, I haven't kept count, but we've had several instances where someone posted something on social media about I'm going to take a bomb to school or I'm going to go to school and kill a bunch of people and the school system shut down. Um, so this, so, so if, if you've got that kind of thing happening and how, how can we, how can we preserve privacy, but yet track down some fool that would write something like that. And, and you never know the, the young people, there's one school, the young people said we were just joking. Well, it wasn't a joke to the authorities, you know, and they're probably and they are in, in deep, deep, deep trouble as they've made those kinds of threats. And we had this one man who was uh, who was stalking, or basically had made threats about one of our presidential candidates. He was in the United States Army of all things, and the guy's posting how to make bombs, and uh, he agrees with jihad and stuff like that. 
So balancing that off and using business intelligence in that way, that's a real difficult situation for us. So there's, there, there are some really good, um, there's some really good starting points in chapter six of the textbook for you to be doing some thinking on out. And it's gonna be a, a process, not just for people who run the IT department, it's gonna be for you folks who are running the company. You're gonna be the ones ultimately responsible for trying to come up with these policies and deal with these issues, deal with a crisis if it occurs, uh, deal with a situation where you have, maybe somebody compromises your database, they compromise, uh, your processes, maybe they steal industrial secrets, maybe they get a marketing list. Who knows? It could be any one of a number of things that uh, can be can be um, that, that can be problematic. So, I think that chapters five and six are are pro provide you with a good overview of these emerging technologies and how they are just racing forward, same with the infrastructure, and how they tend to, to put us into some real dilemmas. Now, business is experiencing the same thing that people in the medical profession experienced when we had the development of readily available, what we would call heroic uh, devices, devices that would keep you alive when 20 years ago, you'd be dead. Organ transplants, um, artificial organs, um, all kinds of ways to, to keep a person in a semi-vegetative state with the hope that maybe they'll find a cure. Um, surgical, the improvement of surgical techniques and, 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 and what it's done and, and how we've learned more about how to care for people and the use of, uh, of pharmaceuticals that can extend life as, we've, as, med, as modern medicine has extended life cycles of people, people are living more and longer and longer, it poses some ethical dilemmas and problems. Um, and it's not uncommon for people who are elderly to be told, well, you know, you're 90, you're 85, you don't need that procedure. Uh, you're not gonna live that much longer anyway. <laughs> well, that's one of those, that's the kind of issue, or do we keep a person on life support or not? Well. Our problems are not going to be that dramatic, but we're facing those same kinds of ethical dilemmas. Do we watch our employees? How much do we watch them? Where do we put cameras and surveillance? Yesterday, um, I, I had a revelatory moment. I was watching uh, PBS News Hour, and they were talking about the they were talking about the, the the political stuff that's going on in the Ukraine, and then they were also no, they were talking that it was about their special report. Excuse me, the special report they're doing on China, and I was shocked when I heard that China. You're not gonna. I couldn't believe it when I heard it. Has two hundred million. 200 million surveillance cameras and facial recognition units. They watch people from birth to death. And if we know anything about totalitarian states or authoritarian states, we know that if they can watch you and you do something they don't like, they can come get you. In China, if, if they don't like what somebody's doing, they take their bank account or they freeze it. When I heard 200 million cameras, I was just shocked. Now, when I was over in Europe, I was, I was, it was to me, it was interesting to see the growth of CCTV. Um, and I thought, wow, I mean, you, you'd look up at every, any, on any street, on any kind of public transportation, uh, there would, you, you would see 
cameras. Uh, you go along the River Thames in a, ruse, in a cruise by, by Parliament, and there's nothing but one one set of cameras after the other. Now they're they're positioned so that they're you really have to be looking for them. But I watched as a, as we went by Parliament on the Thames River, there was probably 150 cameras watching us from every single angle. Well, that's a security measure. And people there are just used to it. Uh, we're not. And I think it's gonna be an interesting challenge for us to, uh, to, to try to come to grips with that. Well, I'm gonna stop here for a minute. I'm gonna see if anybody has any questions about some of the assignments this week or, or, what, I, or, or what I've asked you to do. Anybody? Uh, and I will unmute you all if somebody does have a question, or if you do, you can use the chat device. Anybody have a question? Okay, well, I don't, at this point, I don't see anybody that has one. Um, again, I think we've, I think I've beaten to death or I've given you a really good overview of, of, of chapter six and what it's all about. And again, it's just this question of the foundations of business intelligence. And you'll notice it's about policy, not about machines or software or hardware. It's about and it's about peopleware and what I call thought and what I call um, governanceware. Do people have a sense of how information is governed and how and why they use particular information? So that's pretty much it in, in terms of, of what I would have to share today. Uh, the assignments are all due in terms of they're they're due on, on Friday. And I hope as you, as you go out and, and look at some of these resources, I'm, I'm counting on you to do that, not, as an, not for an assignment where you get points, but to enrich what's here in the text and, and in the course to, to go in, in depth a little bit more. Um, and just by way of example, I just wanna show you again that here's the web safari. And uh, okay. facial recognition, wearable computers. People have Fitbits now. Um, if you plug your earphones into your head <laughs> when you're listening to a device, you've got a wearable computer. Um, that phone or whatever you're listening to now is, is, is you're wearing it. It's an interesting, interesting, uh, interesting information over there. The, then some Ted guest speakers, virtual reality and Bill and, uh, and its role in sports. And then, Augmented reality maps, great, great advances being done. Photosynth, which is a, way, a, a technique used to combine pictures or to use of a database. And BumpTop, which is a, a database, BumpTop, which is an application that lets you manage your desktop. I wanna go over and take a look at it. Sometimes you'll hit some of these things, but this, this should be alive and some very engaging speakers in terms of, of, uh, of what's there. Um, and then of course, these other resources and links, I think you'll find the NASA PRISM, PRISM program, the NASA, pardon me, the NSA, National Security Administration, um, fascinating uh, to look at and so, I would encourage you 
to go out and, and take a look at them and spend some time. So I've I, I given you about 30 extra minutes here today to say, I'm going to challenge you uh, to go out and look for some information like this. And also, I would encourage you, if you want, if you, if you go out and you find an article, for example, about business intelligence, or you find a, a, a website that's useful, send it to me and I'll share it with everybody. Uh, I'll post it over the announcements and say, hey, take a look at it, or I'll throw it down here in the modules and say, here's who contributed and take a look at it. Um, I'm, I'm not wanting to do it. I'm not trying to create a discussion board or anything like that. But if you find something that you think is worthwhile for us to take a look at, I think it would be, uh, I'd certainly would welcome it. And I would encourage you to do so. I'm not saying I would give you extra points. Uh, I would say this, you're the one who's going to benefit from the benefit from the experience of going out there and looking for those things. And as I'm talking about that, again, I'm going to just pop up here to the course resources. Okay. And we went, we, we visited the LB online library. And I got some really nice feedback from the people over there. They were just thrilled to death. Um, they have all of these resources over there and they're online. And they, I, I think they get a little frustrated because they feel like we may not use the resources as much as we should. Here are some professional resources, Insight by Stanford Business, their publication, Harvard Business School, uh, and uh, MIT Sloan Management, their online publications. Um, Knowledge at Wharton, another thing to see what are the top people in the world talking, in the business world talking about, or go over and do a search on business intelligence and see what, what, uh, what they've got out there. Um, also, because we are faith-based, I would encourage you to go over and take a look at some of the, the, uh, the articles that are published by the Christian Business Faculty Association. I think there's, I think I have, a, uh, uh, I think there's a link to their journal there as well as the association. And uh, these are people who teach business in, in, in uh, faith-based institutions like OBU who are trying to talk about how do we take these concepts of the marketplace, et cetera, and look at them through the prism of, and, and, the, and the prism and the filter of our beliefs as, as, as Christians. How does it fit? Uh, do, do, does, how, to what extent does our economic system come into conflict with very straightforward biblical ad, admonitions about how the poor are to be treated. Um, and why do we have businesses? Why did God give us that tool, et cetera? So I think you'll want to take a look at some, uh, some of the articles over there as well. Um, and I guess that would, that would be pretty much it in terms of what I think today would be worth sharing with you. Um, I want to do wanted to take just a couple of more minutes and I'm going to go over here to the New York Times. I saw an article that really got my attention. The business, the, um, the I understand a lot of people, I tell people I really use the New York Times a lot because they say, oh, it's this liberal newspaper. But look, if you go into the business section, the business section there is, is authoritative. It's every bit as good as the Wall Street Journal. And the text section is excellent as well. And one of the parts of there I really, really like is the uh, deal section, the section that deals, that, that, hand, that looks at mergers and acquisition deal book. So I'll take a look over here for just a second. Okay. And this is the one I wanted to show you that I thought was really interesting. Now, 70 countries have had disinformation campaigns. 
70, which means disinformation, the use of information resources, a, 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 a bad use, in my opinion, of business intelligence is becoming a common way of dealing with friends and adversaries. And so I think, I think that one, that article uh, has some good thoughts for us to look at. One of the other, the, the other article that caught my eye was this one about the concentration of power, i.e. market power of technology companies. We're experiencing a moment here in 2019, just like it was experienced at the end of the 19th century, when you had these massive, like um, Rockefeller, with Standard Oil, um, Vanderbilt, who owned, I think, half of the railroads in the United States. You had these trusts from the people of what we call the Gilded Age that were, were had such tremendous marketing power. Rockefeller was another. They had such tremendous marketing power they could just snuff out competitors, and that's and, and that's became the impetus for the development of antitrust legislation in the United States. Well, we're back to another one of those moments where we have these firms that have been incredibly successful and they deal in, in firms that, are, that, that deal with information. They're, they're knowledge-based firms. And this question of the concentration of their power um, especially as the article talks about here, the development of artificial intelligence really has people concerned and it really has gotten the attention of the government who says, these people are just gobbling up more and more of the market share. To give you an example, Google ads has 86, 86 to 87% of all of the online ad business. <laughs> that is, that's a, that's, that approaches the kind of monopoly uh, or concentration that Henry Ford had when he first started making Model Ts. Um, Henry Ford had 95% of the market. Yes, there were other people who made automobiles, but people bought them from Ford because he had perfected the assembly line. And so he could, he could build and sell cars far cheaper than anybody. But nonetheless, he caught the eye of the government because he had such tremendous power. So I think those two are, are, are some articles that are well worth your time to take a look at, and they're certainly within the flow of what, of what we're doing here. Well, not having, not seeing anybody's got any additional questions, I'm going to sign us off. I do appreciate all of you who are here, and uh, I look forward to seeing your work uh, at the end of the week, and uh, have a good one.